Good morning, everyone, and thank you all for being with us today. I'm Rob Bonta, California Attorney General, and let me begin by congratulating our Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, for her fortitude and her vision in creating this task force in her previous role as a member of the California State Assembly, which I was very proud and honored to always call her a colleague and continue to be honored to call her that today. And let me also thank Governor Newsom for having the courage and vision to help make that piece of legislation, Assembly Bill 3121, a reality. I'm proud to have been a co-author of the bill during my time in the Assembly and to now be in a position as the Attorney General, a role I view as being the people's attorney to help assist all of you on the task force as you work to bring this effort to life. In fact, one of the very first tasks of my office's newly formed Racial Justice Bureau will be to do just that, support all of you in this foundational and hopefully transformational endeavor. Please do not hesitate to make use of our team. That's what we're here for at the California Department of Justice. We will be here every step of the way to help ensure this task force has the resources, administrative, technical, and legal, it needs to get this job done. And this job is monumental. It's historic. Slavery is this country's original sin, a stain on our history, and a continued open wound. You are all charged with helping California acknowledge that. Although the horrors of slavery may have begun in the past, its harms are felt every single day by black Americans in the present. Those harms are felt in unequal education and health outcomes. They are felt in the staggering inequality of wealth in this country. They are felt in tragedies like the murder of George Floyd, which a year ago sparked a movement that again shed light on the stark experience of black Americans when it comes to how we do public safety. The list goes on. And ultimately this task force is a first step, but it's a step we should all be proud of. I know my parents who were social justice champions, my father marched alongside Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, both of them who organized with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and Philip Veracruz are absolutely beaming because of our efforts here today and your work. Never has any state government in 400 years of American history embarked on such an expansive effort of truth and reconciliation around the institution of slavery and its present day effects. The fact is, California continues to lead the nation, but as a nation, we have moved far too slowly. This first convening comes right on the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, the destruction of Black Wall Street, a tragedy that for too long had been obscured from our collective consciousness by our exceptionalism and inability to confront the past. The first meeting comes more than 150 years after the Union Army marched on Galveston, Texas, to help put an end to slavery just months before the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution formally abolished it, but still could not adequately address the insidious effects of slavery on our society. And we're gathered more than 400 years after the arrival of the first enslaved Africans to our shores, men and women who are torn from their homes and their loved ones. The truth is that the institution of slavery is inextricably woven into the establishment, history, and prosperity of this country. Slavery deprived more than four million Africans and their descendants of life, liberty, citizenship, cultural heritage, and economic opportunity. And following its abolition, our governments at the federal, state, and local levels continued to perpetuate, condone, and often profit from practices that brutalized Black Americans and excluded them from meaningful participation in society. The legacy of slavery and racial discrimination have resulted in debilitating economic, educational, and health hardships that are uniquely experienced by Black Americans today. And during this pandemic in particular, we haven't had to look far to see those consequences. But ultimately, whether our ancestors were here or not, whether they were part of the machinery of slavery or not, we must all ask ourselves as Americans and as Californians, how we can work together to form a more per perfect union. How can we work together to remedy the harm and trauma that has been and continues to be inflicted on generations of our brothers and sisters? As a task force, that is explicitly your purpose, to help us develop proposals to address wounds that have too long been allowed to fester, to recommend appropriate remedies of compensation, rehabilitation, and restitution for African Americans with special consideration for descendants of those who are enslaved in the United States. Yes, there has been progress in this country, but it has been all too uneven and it has not moved fast enough. We must move quickly. How much longer can we wait for justice? How much longer until we are able to truly fulfill the promise 
of the American dream that all are created equal and endowed with certain unalienable rights. This task force is an idea whose time has come. But it is up to all of you to fashion it, to mold it, and to bring it to life, whether it's the return of stolen land at Bruce's Beach or housing grants in Evanston, Illinois, we must act. It has been more than a year since the murder of George Floyd, but we remain in the middle of a racial justice reckoning in this country. And this moment demands that we confront the realities of systemic inequality and structural racism. For the United States to be truly a just nation, we must speak truth to the horrors of slavery and its role in creating the racism that black Americans face today and every day in our neighborhoods and in our institutions. California, we must acknowledge our dark history and the role that slavery played in our state's founding. We must acknowledge the racially discriminatory housing policies that prevented black Americans from owning homes and building wealth. We must acknowledge the black middle-class neighborhoods that were destroyed to build highways and parks. Part of this process, we must look at ourselves and at our own institutions, including right here at the California Department of Justice. The work of this task force will play a critical role in helping unearth these histories, sometimes purposely forgotten, and begin a sorely needed process of healing. And that healing isn't about one community, it's about all of us. I'm confident that what you all do here together will reverberate across this country and in turn around the world. It is in these moments where we all have an opportunity to truly make a difference. We eagerly await your insight and your recommendations, appreciate your commitment, your passion, your service. I thank you. And with that, it's my honor to turn it over to my former and current colleague, the inimitable and the amazing Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber. Good morning, and uh, I am honored to be here today with my good friend who is now the Attorney General, Rob Bonta, and we have fought many battles together and have been victorious in so many others. Today is an amazing day in California and in this nation. Uh, as pointed out, California is the largest state in the, in the union, and it's the fifth largest economy in the world. And it is finally fulfilling the mandate of AB 3121 and holding its first reparations task force meeting, the first of any state in this nation. And so that makes it a historic moment for over the 400 years of African Americans in this country. I was honored to be able to author AB 3121 and bold enough to believe that uh, folks would vote for it and that we would pass it and that the governor would sign it and it would become a reality in California. As the assembly member for the 79th district and as chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus, we felt very strongly about the fact that we needed to take some steps that others had not taken. And AB 3121 was those steps. Some asked us why in California, why not somewhere else? Why did we not do it in the South? But we came to understand very clearly that California has the ability and the power to do it. And if not us, then who? We have waited for almost 40 years for the Congress to basically pass H.R. 40, and we're still waiting for them to take seriously the development of a national task force. So we believe very strongly that we can move forward. As my colleague pointed out, this is a bittersweet moment because as we sit here and begin to talk about reparations, we're ever conscious of the fact that 100 years ago, a massacre occurred in Tulsa, Oklahoma. And this massacre was hid for so many years by, by the government itself and not wanting to acknowledge the bombing of, of Greenwood in Tulsa, Oklahoma. The destruction of a black a successful city, a, a city that was designed to really provide independence and economic development for African Americans. And it was destroyed because of racism and viciousness and jealousy. And I, as I think about Greenwood, I would say, well, you know, um, uh, that was really just an anomaly, but the reality is when you study the history uh, between, 18, uh, between 1863 and 1923 with Rosewood, there were over 25 different massacres that occurred in this country. Massacres where the land was destroyed, people were killed, and people were terrorized, and their wealth was taken and turned into something else. And so as a result, we have continuing examples of that. And Greenwood emphasizes, and so many of the other massacres emphasize that despite the hard work that people say African Americans needed to do, despite the hard work that we put in invested, despite all of our efforts to basically be independent, to, to not depend upon the government, 
despite all those efforts, we were basically denied an opportunity to basically prosper in this nation intentionally. And those, that denial was not only done by individuals, but sanctioned by the government itself, which makes reparations in 2021 so very, very important. I wanna thank my staff for having written an amazing speech. And most of you know, I, I'm notorious for not following instructions of my staff. Uh, and I have wonderful history information that my colleague, Mr. Bonta, just shared with all of you about the depth of, of, of the racism that's here. And so when I got up this morning, I said, if someone tells all of the information that I have written down, what am I gonna say to this illustrious committee? What am I gonna say to you and to the over 100 and some odd individuals who are attending this hearing and the others who will read it? What should I say as a Secretary of State, as an African-American woman, as a person who's been a part of so much of this country, whose parents were sharecroppers, who, who had to leave the South as a result of the racism that's there and denied an opportunity to grow and develop economically in Arkansas. What can I say? And what can I say on behalf of my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather who was born in slavery? What can I say at this moment, at this time that would make a difference? And I had to remind myself to say what was on my heart and what is on my feelings with regards to where we are with, 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 with this particular issue. And I asked someone, what does it feel like? What does it feel like to live in a country that never says, I'm sorry? What does it feel like to be in a country where you are continually abused, misused, ignored, and no one ever stops and says, gee, we were wrong? No one, what, what does it feel like for folks not to try to repair the damage done for you, to you? How does it feel to live in a place that you may feel like you may never actually get your justice, your due, your support, your respect? You know, I told someone, it reminds me sometimes of being in a room where someone comes along every day and steps on your foot and never says, I'm sorry. Never says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. And they come by every day and they step on your foot and your foot is constantly being stepped on by individuals. And so you decide that maybe it's where you had your foot. Maybe you put your foot in the wrong place. So you begin to move your foot and no matter how you move it, no matter even if you're sitting on a bench and you tuck it underneath, they will find your foot to step on. Because as soon as you bring it out, someone is going to step on your foot. And you begin to walk with a limp because of the foot and the pain of, your, of what is happening in your life. And then you, at some point, you began to look around and realize that no one else is having their foot stepped on the way yours is. Even those who just came into the room from somewhere else are not having their foot stepped on. And you begin at some point to believe that it is their right to step on your foot, that you don't deserve the justice that's there. And you try to create for yourself an alternative world that is a second class citizen world that allows your foot not to be so visible knowing that it will always be stepped on. That is what it feels like to be in a country that never says, I'm sorry. That despite all of the hard work of my parents, my grandparents, my great grandparents, despite the efforts to, to buy land, to own land, despite my dad's effort to work very hard in, in farming his land in Hope, Arkansas, his land, and was denied an opportunity to harvest his own crop in time because he was forced to harvest someone else's crop. Despite all of those honest efforts that were there, he was still being stepped on. And when he stood up for himself, his life was threatened. That's a story of African-Americans in this country. That's the story of Greenwood. That's the story of everyone else. And then people move on and take advantage of your land and your opportunity, and they grow and prosper, and they turn around and wonder, why haven't you done likewise? I think my ancestors want me to say to you always that it is time Time for folks to acknowledge the harm that's been done, the harm that continues to be done, that it is not that far difference between what happened to my father in Hope, Arkansas, and what happened to George Floyd, and what happens to so many others in this country. They're not that far apart. That the racism of this country has created an environment that allows the kind of injustice to occur. And so when we began to look at this, and I, and I, and I wanna, as I say, apologize to my staff for not reading their speech, but, but I just wanted to make sure that we all understood the significance of this moment, that we, you will have lots of history and lots of data and lots of information. But at the core of it is a group of people who have never been said, anyone has said, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. Let me change the system so that your children and your grandchildren 
and your great grandchildren will not have to endure the same indignities and the same destruction that you've had to endure. We are here today because the racism of slavery birth and an unjust system and a legacy of racial harm and an inequality that continues today in every aspect of our life. That we cannot separate the things that people are crying for in the streets in terms of justice from what has happened in the past. And that we are here, you're here today not just to seek an answer to say, was there harm? But your task is to determine the depth of the harm and the ways in which we are to repair that harm. There has been enough research on the fact that slavery still has an impact in today, that the economic injustices, the educational injustices, the social injustices, the judicial injustices go on and on and on, and that we have to call a stop and a halt. And we must be aggressive in our efforts to be honest and direct and to figure out what we need to do in California and be an example to the rest of the nation of how do we begin to reckon with ourselves and be truthful with ourselves about who we are and what it takes for us to have a unique experience, a unique society that really values the contributions of African Americans and so many others. I wanna take this opportunity to thank all of you for accepting this task. It is extremely important and it is very dear to me. I wanna make sure that you understand that as Secretary of State, you have the support of my office, you have the support of our archives, which keeps California's history, and that is housed in the Secretary of State. I've informed my staff that as you need things, as you decide to do things that require California's history and resources, that they are to make themselves available because this is an important step for California. And as a Secretary of State, I wanna make sure that you hear us and that we're part of it. I wanna thank our governor. I cannot say enough for Gavin Newsom, the governor of the state, who, who was bold enough to sign it without even blinking once about signing AB 3121, that realizing that it is now time for us to make a change. I wanna thank this, the, the President Pro Tem, Tony Atkins, and our Speaker Rendon for appointing members to this, uh, to this task force. They too were supportive of this effort that's there. I cannot say enough about the California Legislative Black Caucus and its members as they all signed on to this bill and were enthusiastic about it. And of course, I thank my colleagues, my colleagues in the Assembly and the Senate. People across the nation ask me, how did you get this bill passed? And it's not just because we had a Democratic uh, a legislature, but when you look at the votes, there were Democrats and Republicans who signed on to this bill, some of them in the face of their own constituents who didn't want them to sign it, to say, this is it, this is time, this is just, we must move forward and do this. So I wanna thank your task force members for your support for coming together today and beginning this process. I am optimistic that it will be a very open and enthusiastic process, that the people of California will want to know more about the work that you do, and that when we come up with the remedies and suggestions that it will be embraced by our legislature, it will be embraced by Californians because we believe that there's opportunity in California and that the things that happened in the past have to be reckoned with and that we must move forward. So once again, thank you so very much for joining. I am honored to have been the author of this bill, and I'm looking forward to basically championing your results and being a part as of, of the kinds of recommendations that you're going to have. I thank my good friend, Mr. Bonta, who is now the AG and his office for the work that they're doing, and I am confident knowing him and his staff that you're in very good hands as we move forward as a commission, as you move forward as a state, and as we move forward as a nation. Thank you so very much for having me here this morning. Good morning. Thank you, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, Secretary of State Weber, the California Legislature, greetings task force members, colleagues, and guests. My name is Aisha Martin Walton, and I am with the Department of Justice, Civil Rights Enforcement Section, and I
Good morning. This is a test. Can you hear me? We're having some technical difficulties, but we will be hearing from the governor in a moment. Well, let me welcome all of you to the first convening of the Reparations Task Force. This, as you all know well, came to fruition because of the tireless efforts, extraordinary uh, leadership of Secretary, now Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, and years and years of advocacy and work on behalf of activists all across the state of California, and for that matter, all across the nation. You know, as our country reckons with our painful legacy of racial injustice, California, again, is poised to, to lead the way lead the way towards a, a more equitable and inclusive future for all. Our tireless pursuit of equality in every aspect of life, from economy, health, housing, education, criminal justice, and more, continues today. A year ago, in the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd and, and numerous others at the hands of police, millions took to the streets, you know this well, all across this country and here in California, calling for an end to the violence. And as they continue to speak out to demand justice and equality, uh, I heard those voices. And I had the privilege to travel all across the state to, to listen to our youth, our young folks, uh, faith leaders and community leaders. And I'm grateful for what they shared with me and for their passion and more importantly, a sense of real urgency. That's why I was honored to sign in September of last year, Assembly Bill 3121, which established this task force to study reparations for slavery. And with this bill, we're bringing together some of the, the best, the brightest minds to, to chart a path forward to move to a more equal California. Again, thank you. Thank you to the legislator, and thank you to all of you activists uh, that are here and assembled, those of you serving on the task force who made today possible. I'm grateful for your partnership, your leadership, for your faith and devotion to the cause that unites us, and that's the cause of equality. Good morning. Thank you, Governor Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, Secretary of State Weber, the California Legislature, and greetings to task force members, colleagues, and guests. My name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice, the Civil Rights Enforcement Section, and I will be administering your oath of office. Will you please raise your right hand and repeat after me? I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear or affirm. I do solemnly swear and 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 affirm. Okay, as a group, that I will support and defend. That I will support and support and defend. The Constitution of the United States. Constitution, the Constitution of, the United, of the, United States. United States. the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution, and the Constitution of the State, State of California. 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 Against all enemies, mm -hmm. foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And domestic. And domestic. That I will bear truth, faith, and allegiance. Mm -hmm. I will bear true faith, faith and allegiance to the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. The Constitution of the State of California. That I take this obligation freely. Take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental, any mental reservation. reservation. Or a purpose of evasion. Or a purpose, purpose of evasion. evasion. And that I will well and faithfully. And that I will, I will well, well and faithfully. faithfully. 
discharge the duty upon which I am about to enter. Which I'm about to enter. That concludes the oath. Thank you and congratulations, task force members. And I look forward to working with you all to implement AB 3121 over the next two years. Thank you. Hello, my name is Michael Newman, and I am the Senior Assistant Attorney General of the Civil Rights Enforcement Section in the Department of Justice. I am very pleased to be here today for the initial Reparations Task Force meeting and to meet the newly appointed member. Our section is here to provide the administrative, technical, and legal assistance that you all may need to carry out your duties as set forth in AB 3121. With the leadership and guidance of Attorney General Bonta, the DOJ has committed a team of lawyers, researchers, and administrators to support the important work that you all will be carrying out. To that end, I would like to uh, introduce you to the Attorney General Civil Rights Enforcement Section and the Research Center teams uh, devoted to this project. They have been working diligently since the bill was signed into law in anticipation of today's meeting and the important work in which the task force will be engaged over the next 24 months, which we are excited to be supporting. First, I'll introduce our Supervising Deputy Attorney General, Sarah Belton, who will be overseeing all aspects of our office's work for the task force. Good morning. I look forward to working with all of you to implement AB 3121 over the next two years. Next, the project lead is Deputy Attorney General Si Yuen Yang. Good morning. It's such an honor to be here. We also have a number of Deputy Attorneys General who are supporting the work of the Reparations Task Force. First is Jocelyn Singh. Hi, good morning, everyone. It's an honor to be able to support the work of this task force. Next is Kungalpur Kaur Singh. Hi, good morning to you all. It's such an honor to be a part of this task force and to work towards reparations. Next is Laura Fair. Good morning. It's a true honor and a privilege to be working with all of you in the task force. We really are looking forward to the year ahead. And next is Francisco Balderrama. Hello, good morning. It's very nice to see everyone here, and I'm very honored and excited to be part of such an important, important and historic event. And finally, Lafonali, Jimmy Richardson. Hey, good morning. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. It's great to see all of you. We also have retired annuitant Aisha Martin Walton. Good morning. It's so good to be here, and I look forward to working with everyone for this important, important project. And Legal Secretary Noel Garcia. And I, I don't know if Noel is able to, to get on, but uh, he definitely passes along uh, his greetings as well. Um, from our research center, oh, from our research center, we have Director Dr. Randy Chance. Good morning, everybody. I'm excited to be here with all of you and appreciate everyone taking their time to attend this important meeting. We have Program Manager Dr. Ch Tiffany Jance DeSormo. Hello, I am grateful to support the important work of this task force. Thank you. And we have Dr. Janie Scott. Hello, everyone. It is an honor and a privilege to provide research support services for this important and historic work. I want to reiterate uh, just how much our work, how much work our team has already done in anticipation of today's uh, auspicious day um, to prepare to support the task force in carrying out these incredibly important duties within the tight timeframes set forth in the statute. 
it is truly an honor to have the Civil Rights Enforcement Section and the Department of Justice support you all in this critical and important first in the nation effort. And now it is my pleasure to have Supervising Deputy Attorney General Sarah Belton provide you with an introduction to the Bagley Keen Act. Thank you, Michael. Um, and as we transition away from this agenda item, I'm gonna thank all of my DOJ colleagues and reassure the task force members that we are indeed coming to them for their introductions. So as a reminder, we will be unmuting your video and your audio. And we thank you in advance for muting yourselves when you are not speaking. We are going to ask each task force member to briefly introduce themselves. And we will be going today in alphabetical order because it was the easiest and didn't require us to select among these very qualified individuals. We will begin with Senator Stephen Bradford. Senator Bradford, your introduction. Thank you and good morning. I'm truly honored to be here today and join this task force. And again, I wanna thank Dr. Shirley Weber, not only my former colleague in the legislature, but my college professor at San Diego State over 40 years ago for her tremendous leadership and her continued leadership now as Secretary of State. My former colleague in the assembly also, uh, Mr. Bonta, now Attorney General and the governor for signing the monumental piece of legislation stated, I'm humbled to serve on this task force. It's probably the most important endeavor I uh, will take and uh, be a part of. It's tr truly uh, probably most important work I've done in the last 22 years as an elected official. Uh, I'm honored to represent the 35th Senate District, which is comprised of the cities of Inglewood, Hartthorne, Lawndale, Torrance, Cardina, Carson, Compton, and the communities of Watts, Willowbrook, and San Pedro. And um, it is not lost on me, as been stated already, that today uh, marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa tragedy, and it speaks volumes to what is so badly needed as it relates to reparations for African Americans in this country. It's somewhat ironic. Uh, I was driving downtown this past Friday, and I saw a young African American young lady standing on the street corner with a hoodie on, and it's to simply stated, they've stolen more than we've ever looted. And that was telling, because that is the African-American experience here in America, here in California, that we have lost more than we have ever taken from this country. We have given more than it has ever been given to us. As Dr. Martin Luther King stated, this country has wrote a promissory note to African-Americans that continue to come back mark insufficient funds. I'm hoping that this task force will allow us to address those insufficient funds and put forth a meaningful uh, path to reparations. And people say, well, what should that look like? It simply can model the GI Bill. Just as President Roosevelt came up with the GI Bill to reward the men and women who fought for this country back in World War II, Reparations can surely look like that, providing free education for descendants of slaves at our Cal State and UC system, providing first time home buyers assistance to provide Medicare and childcare. Uh, and those are very easy uh, examples of what this reparations can look like uh, without bankrupting the state and, and moving forward again. There is much to be addressed here, but uh, if we really put our heads together, it, it's it's very easy to uh, attain, uh, uh, I, I would say justice, so to speak, and, uh, and have a meaningful impact uh, with this task force. I'm also honored to be the author of SB 796, which is an example of what reparations can look like in that of Bruce's Beach in Manhattan, uh, Beach, California, property that was stolen again from African Americans 97 years ago from Charles and Willa Bruce, an African American couple who adhered to the laws of the land then and opened up an African American beach house, a resort, a, a uh, dining hall, a dance hall, catering to African Americans. And again, was it the loss of life that we experienced in Tulsa? 
No, but it was truly the murdering of a dream of an enterprise that clearly could have led to generational wealth for the Bruce family. So I'm honored to join, uh, be the author of SB 796, and hopefully it shows an example of what reparations could look like. And when I introduced this bill, they said, well, is this just a one-off situation? And as we know, if we truly understand our history, there's hundreds, if not thousands of examples, as many have been uh, mentioned by Dr. Weber earlier today, uh, today I should say, and by uh, Attorney General Bonta, we can look at Rosewood, we can look at the Chicago massacre, so we can look at what happened in Texas. Property has been stolen and denied from African Americans for over 150 years, and I hope this task force will do a deep dive. Many people say, well, California wasn't a slave state, but we adhere to all the principles of those slave states. Uh, and we have a debt of uh, obligation to, uh, to African Americans who were treated just as harshly here in California as they would have been had they been in the South. So I'm excited to be part of this task force. I look forward to working with the Legislative Black Caucus, which I chair, and uh, helping shape what we do here on this uh, task force and coming with meaningful uh, solutions and, and addressing uh, many of the mishaps and, uh, and the terrible situation. And I'll give one more example that many people don't even know about here in California. In my district, in the South Bay, where I grew up, what, where now sits Alondra Park and El Camino College, that was once an African-American community, housing community. And it was because of a wealthy attorney we're all familiar with the law firm O'Melvin Omel and Myers. That attorney, Mr. O'Melvin, was appalled that he had to drive from downtown Los Angeles to his home in Palos Verdes and pass this African-American community in the 20s and the 30s. And he called his friends and had uh, them use eminent domain to rid this community, again, a housing community of African-Americans. So we have hundreds of examples of where African Americans have been displaced in this uh, state and across this country. So I'm honored to serve and I look forward to working with each and every one of you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Radford. We will now go to next in alphabetical order, Dr. Amos Brown. Dr. Brown, do we have you? Thank you very much. I am humble and highly privileged as the senior pastor of the historic Third Baptist Church of San Francisco for now 45 years to realize a vision and dream coming true that Miss Marie Davis, President Emeritus, of the San Mateo branch of the NACP has spoken about for at least 40 years at every state conference of the NACP. And I was her sidekick in stating that I never forgot what my teacher, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said in class one day. Let me say parenthetically, Dr. King taught only one class in his lifetime after finishing Boston University with that PhD degree in systematic theology. He said one day in class, if America has organized to do bad things against the Negro, it has the obligation, the moral obligation, to organize and work with the Negro to do good things for the Negro. That was, in my estimation, way back then in 1962, a statement of reparations and affirmative action. And I want to thank Dr. Weber, Weber excuse me, the governor, and every person who had a role to play 
and making sure that this idea, whose time has come, is put into action and that it will not be a paralysis of an analysis, but we will have the courage to recommend to this state concrete, tangible expressions that will represent good things being done for the Negro. I need not recite all of the evils done. Certainly I could go back to my native state of Mississippi, where in 1875, at the place where my grandfather, my grandfather, Rafe Robinson, and others were victimized by that massacre at Clinton when the Confederacy would not give up. And that was the last battle, according to historians, of the Civil War at Vicksburg and at Clinton. I don't think we need to just look way back there. We don't even just quote what happened at Greenwood as horrific evil. Let me say parenthetically too, you know, Mr. Bush, former President Bush, popularized the phrase, the axis of evil. Well, it's high time that America fess up, confess its sin of racism and injustice against blacks. But well, this embodies an axis of evil. But we can be the agents of good when we see that it was not just slavery, as inhumane as that was, 400 years worldwide, 250 years in America. We don't need to go way back there. Let's just deal with how, within the last 50 years, specifically in San Francisco, a so-called program of urban renewal, which I consider not been anything about renewal, but about black removal, right here in San Francisco, the old Fillmore, the Harlem of the West, like Greenwood, now only represents one block. So we need not, as great and good and excellent as it is, to be enlightened, do our homework, to make sure that we document things. It's already been documented. It's in place. And my hope is that we will be living examples of Nike's slogan, which says, just do it. And I hope that this task force will be about doing the right thing. The areas of education, economic empowerment, cultural enrichment, making sure that we reclaim these watering holes that African-Americans had in South Central Los Angeles, here in the Fillmore, 14th Street in Washington, D.C., Ferris Street District in Jackson, Mississippi, Tweed Auburn Avenue in Atlanta, Georgia. I could go on and on and cite instances in which whites intentionally destroyed the opportunities of blacks to celebrate their ethnic heritage and live in places where they experience the celebration of their culture, their great doings, and noble history. Thank you. Thank you, my friends, for permitting me to join with you. And thank you, Governor Newsom, Dr. Weber, 
Thank you, every soul who is of good will and has the heart that all Americans should have, and that is to do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And as a footnote, you know, I'm a history buff. We also have got to clean up the mess and the virus that the first governor of this state created. And that was one Peter Burnett, whose image is in that state capitol. He was an arch racist from Nashville, Tennessee, and even led the first wagon train westward in 1843. And his first official act of business was to say, no blacks or mulattoes will be permitted to be in this wagon train. And when they got to the Oregon Territory, what did Mr. Peter Burnett do? He established an ordinance that was dubbed, that was named for him, the Peter Burnett Flogging Law, that stated any black or mulatto who was caught in Oregon Territory would be beaten every six months until they left town. And when he left Oregon and came down to California, 1848. What did the man do? He tried to get an assembly bill established that no blacks would be permitted to settle at all in California. So in addition to the programmatic areas that I've touched on, I'm saying that in terms of our brand and our image and the virus that Peter Burnett infected this state with, when he became governor, we need to right that wrong and say, that was not to be California. And we're gonna make California what it ought to be. One state, liberty and justice, opportunity and respect for all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Moving along alphabetically, we will next move to Dr. Cheryl Grills. Dr. Grills, your introduction. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I am uh, ever mindful of the statement on my favorite t-shirt, which I almost wore today. And the statement on the t-shirt says, I am my ancestors' wildest dreams. To serve on this task force is an honor, but it is also personal for me as a daughter of South Carolina, whose mother literally picked cotton growing up in South Carolina, whose beloved grandfather, who I looked up to, he was a giant in my eyes, is listed on to this day in the US census as a bag boy. Uh, a girl from the South whose families witnessed and experienced lynchings, whose ancestors were stolen away from Nigeria, Ghana, Cameroon, and other parts of West Africa. And they and their children for generations have had to suffer, have had to endure prolonged suffering. My background uh, as a clinical psychologist with a current emphasis in community psychology, as well as my expertise in multi-site community-based participatory research provides the foundation for what I bring to the task force. I'm a national past president of the Association of Black Psychologists. I'm a tenured full professor of psychology at Loyola Marymount University. I've been there for 34 years, and I'm also founder and director of its Psychology Applied Research Center. I'm also the founder and executive director of the Moyer State Community Support Services, which is a 30-year nonprofit organization providing action research program evaluation and strategic technical assistance to social justice and social service community-based organizations around the country. In addition to leading large interdisciplinary research studies, I've also had experience working within systems and public policy. I currently serve as a commissioner and currently now uh, vice chair, but for the last four to five years, I've either been chair or vice chair on the, within the Los, An on the Los Angeles County Civil Brand Commission. 
which addresses conditions and practices within LA County adult jails and until recently, the juvenile lockup facilities and group homes for children in the foster care system. I was co-executive director of the county's Blue Ribbon Commission on Child Protection, which led to important changes in L the LA County child welfare system. In my leadership in the Association of Black Psychologists, I was a founding member of the Alliance of National Psychological Associations for Racial and Ethnic Equity, and I co-designed the Emotional Emancipation Circles Community Self-Help Model established by the Community Healing Network, and I am the lead of the Emotional Emancipation Circles training team, which is international in scope. I train people of African ancestry around the world to facilitate healing circles that address the strain, the stress, and the trauma associated with anti-Black racism. At the request of LA City Councilman Marquise Harris-Dawson, I created and led with my colleague, Dr. Josette Banks, a community-based effort to disrupt violence in South Los Angeles through community-led healing circles designed to reduce the effects of stress and trauma and interrupt cycles of violence in the community. My research interests in publications and projects include African psychology, prevention and treatment and mental health of African Americans, community mental health and applied research with community-based organizations, um, doing a host of social justice actions and um, issue, addressing issues. Among others, I'm the principal investigator le leading the national COVID-19 needs assessment, examining COVID's impact on communities of color. I also am the principal investigator of the California Reducing Disparities Project, which is a statewide 30 site, 36 site mental health disparities demonstration project, and I'm the PI on LA County's Ready to Rise initiative, which is a 49-site LA County positive youth development community demonstration project. In conclusion, the CDC recently declared that racism represents a public health threat. In truth, since the first recorded forced arrival of people of African ancestry to the U.S. as enslaved human beings, Racism has represented a public health threat for Black people in particular and American society in general. Now, discussions about reparations often focus on economic and related factors, but not enough attention to the health and mental health ramifications. So as a psychologist and a social scientist, I bring the perspective that is not often invoked in reparations discussions. I also bring the unique perspective of Black psychology as, as that past president of the Association of Black Psychologists. And I want to also just mention that when we look at the issue of, of reparations, um, there are several kind of steps to the process. And one of the earliest steps needs to be knowing what the harm is, what the damage was that was done, and then having a, um, a, a strong commitment to truth telling. And then only by knowing what the harms are and telling the truth about those harms can we then begin to repair the damage. But there's another step that we also need to take into account. And that step is understanding why did we have a society where entire groups of people in that society an entire class in that society get, did the harm. Why did that happen? And then why were people blocking the truth? And why are we struggling with this idea about the rightness of repairing the damage? We have to understand the drivers in terms of the human psyche and the human condition because this is not simply a matter of coming up with some policies and some practices, some laws on the book and some resources. If we don't go to the root cause in terms of the human psyche and the human condition, we will only be doing window dressing. So it is truly an honor to be able to be on this commission. I thank you for this opportunity and I turn it back over. Thank you very much, Dr. Grills. Lisa Holder, your introduction, please. Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Holder. 
I'm truly honored to be a part of this esteemed group of activists, scholars, lifelong soldiers of justice. I'm humbled as I listen to your depth of knowledge and to your commitment, and I am inspired by the work that you have done. I am always inspired by Secretary Dr. Shirley Weber and her visionary activism. And I want to thank the governor for his bravery and commitment to this task force. I also want to thank the Attorney General and the DOJ for all of the support that they have already provided and for their partnership. I come to this work as a lifelong activist, social justice warrior, and litigator and civil rights attorney. And what I bring to this task force is my experience of over 20 years as a civil rights litigator. I currently run my own civil rights practice based in Los Angeles, where I focus on police misconduct litigation and constitutional policing. I do wage and hour class actions and workplace discrimination cases. And my, my office also focuses on education equity and bringing, edu and bringing equity to the public education system and helping to dismantle the school to prison pipeline. I also have the pleasure of partnering with the Equal Justice Society, a phenomenal organiz nonprofit organization based in Oakland that works to transform the nation's consciousness on race through litigation, the arts, and education. I've also had the privilege of doing legislative advocacy work in Sacramento over the last few years. During my tenure as the legal director of Equal Justice Society, I worked with legislators and, and, and senators and assembly people in, in Sacramento to draft laws to help to reduce implicit bias in various industries, including in the industries of judge of judgeships, in lawyering, and in uh, medical health, in the medical health field. And working on legislation to ensure that professionals in those fields are being educated on implicit bias and how to provide services to the community with a less with less biased outcomes. I also do education. I period, period, periodically teach the civil rights clinic at UCLA Law. And I also educate folks in private industry and in nonprofits on implicit bias through trainings and helping these industries find diversity solutions. Similar to Dr. Grills, I'm coming at this from a very personal place. I'm so thankful to my ancestors who survived so much trauma, so much pain, so much tragedy, so much brutality, so that I could live so that I could be alive today, so that I could not only survive the way they, they did, but so that I could thrive. I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors, and I am ready to fight to deliver them, our ancestors, justice. What I know after 20 years of activism is that there can be no reconciliation on race in America without truth. There can be no peace 
with respect to race in America without justice. And reparations is a critical pathway to authentic reconciliation and lasting peace. That's why the issue of reparations deserves the attention, exploration, and systematic evaluation that this task force is designed to provide. I am honored to be a part of this truth and reconciliation process, and I thank you. Thank you, Lisa Holder. Moving right along, Assembly Member Reginald Jones Sawyer, your introduction, please, Hi. sir. All right, hopefully you can hear me. Hi. Uh, again, I want to thank the governor, uh, the speaker, uh, the president pro tem, um, Tony Atkins, uh, the, my entire assembly colleagues, the Senate, all the committee chairs, uh, and as a former chair of the California Legislative Black Caucus, who first supported Dr. Weber in this, um, I want to just thank them all. And the reason I mentioned this again, and we people mentioned again, you don't know how hard it is to get a law done. And a, and a substantive law like this was extremely difficult. And it took the courage and the determination of Dr. Weber to make this happen. And we should thank her and thank her and thank her every day that we can. Uh, I represent Assembly District 59, which is South Los Angeles, Huntington Park, Florence Firestone. And, um, and I am also the chair of public safety. And when I got elected in 2012, there were over 140,000 men and women housed in corrections in our prison system. Um, the largest prison plantation on the planet. And over the years, I work really hard to dismantle that because it has such an adverse effect on the African-American community and the Latino community, people who are poor. That number has dropped down below 100,000 because of our efforts to make sure that they don't recidivate and go back and forth into the prison system. Before I leave, I plan to close five prisons. We've never closed a prison, never. We've always built prisons. And so we're reversing this criminal justice system which has not been justice for us and been unequal. And now, uh, when I look back on, as I was raised with my, my, my uncle was one of the Little Rock Nine, when the nine kids integrated Central High School in 1957. He was beaten and kicked. Um, all sorts of atrocities he went through so that I could go to any school that I wanted to. And when my grandmother got that call in the middle of the night to tell her, get your son out of school or your grandson will never make it to school. I was born in 57. That grandson was me. So every day since my mother, grandmother told me that story, because I was a little bit of a mess up in college. But once she told me that story, I had a renewed revitalization in that the education that I was going to receive at USC was a gift, a gift of courage, a gift from my family that I couldn't mess up. And my, my, my grandmother looked me straight in the eye and she told me, you have no right to give up this education, especially what this family went through um, to do that. And so I went on and graduated. And even now I'm in at age 60 something, I'm in a doctoral program at USC and people ask me why I do that and why I'm doing that. Have you accomplished everything you wanted to? And I tell them this personal for me because my grandmother is up in heaven and those individuals, those clan members and segregationists who aren't, I get to poke my finger in their eye because they try to stop me from getting an education. Like they try to stop all African-Americans from getting their education. And so, I now know part of my purpose of being here in the legislature is about reparations, is about doing something for our people. And I read something recently from uh, Thomas Paine, not T. Paine, the rapper, but Thomas Paine, one of the founders of this country, who was a radical grassroots oriented founding father, who said, we have the power to begin the world over again. Reparations gives us the power to begin the world again. This is an individual who in the 1700s talked about having an income for every American by taxing the wealthy landowners. Doesn't that sound familiar? Healthcare for all, 
That is what he was talking about back then. He's a man that said, these are the times that try men's soul in the 1700s. This is the, you are in this, those times right now. If you think about people taking away our voting rights, want to take away um, all the things that people had, had fought for, especially Dr. King. And so I want everyone on this task force, if you have an opportunity to read or reread Dr. Martin Luther King's where do we go from here? Written in 1967. 1967, we still have the same problems. He talked about housing, banking, education, criminal justice system, wealth distribution in that, and given a path on how African Americans can move to the next level. We're all suffering, even to this day, of PTSD from slavery, post-traumatic slavery disorder. Let me say that again, post-traumatic slavery disorder. And those of you who came on and talked about the mental health of what our race has gone through, it's really important that we don't forget that. The trauma that is still in us from hundreds and hundreds of years of us being abused, of us dying, being lynched, all of those things to keep us basically in our place. We now, because of the descendants of slaves, we now have an opportunity to reverse those, those traumatic incidences that kept us down and to move us forward. Because the most important thing about this reparations that, that I'm looking forward to is that it's sustainable. You know, you heard about the 40 acres in the mule. I would say, keep the mule, give me more land because a mule depreciates, a car depreciates. We got to get away from that. And whatever we do with this, whatever we decide, it has to be sustainable. It's not one check and done. We have to come up with ways to make sure that the educational system works for us. We close the wealth gap between us. We make sure we have property because that is the wealth gap and the economists that are probably on here will tell you that's what's keeping us down. And so this is definitely the time where we're trying men's soul, but most of the time, but, but this is the time that we need to step up. This is the time that we save African-American souls, that we take us to the next level. And so I'm, I'm honored to be on this committee. And I would also tell you, look to not just me, but 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 Senator Bradford, because you also have something that's probably unique in some of the other committees. You have two individuals, two out of 120 people that can make a law. So if we need to back up what we want, back up what we need, we can make a law. The governor can't make a law. We can and make sure that this is sustainable. And if we have to put that in writing to make sure they don't take it away from us, like they're trying to do with our voting rights right now, we can do that here in California because that's the most important thing for me, sustainability. Thank you. Thank you, Assemblymember Joan Sawyer. We will now move on to Dr. Javon Scott Lewis with your introductory remarks. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here to get today. Um, I'm Javon Scott Lewis, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Geography at UC Berkeley, uh, where I also co-lead the Economic Disparities Research Cluster at Berkeley's Othering and Belonging Institute. You know, I want to you know thank everybody who got us here. Um, I want to especially thank uh, Secretary of, of State Weber, really for taking up the mantle, right, of Belinda Sutton who in 1783, 80 years before the Emancipation Proclamation, went to the Massachusetts General Court demanding reparations from her enslaver. So what that tells us is that, right, we have been working towards this for some time and even prior to abolition. So my work generally is concerned with race inequality and the consequences of underdevelopment and poverty, which has everything to do with the terms for which we are looking to demand reparations. 
For the past seven years, I have been doing research in Tulsa, Oklahoma, that has been involved with understanding both the conditions and the processes that created the historic Greenwood community, and also the devastating violences, multiple violences, that included not just the race massacre of 1921, but the processes of urban renewal that have followed since then that undid the accomplishments of Greenwood. Moreover, I am concerned today in my research in Tulsa, Oklahoma with the black communities that live today. Those who are located not in historic Greenwood any longer, but in North Tulsa, people who live in places like Sunset Apartments, just north of OSU Tulsa, people who are still living within the wake of the multiple violences that the black community here uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma have faced. I am here to say that reparations cannot just be you know, the kind of final provision of the 14th Amendment. Reparations must be that and then some. It is about understanding that the process and the policy of reparation must be led by the sense of repair. We have to understand the not only the conditions that have brought about the disinvestment, the disenfranchisement of Black communities across this country, but also the terms by which those communities can feel healed and repaired. In other words, what does it feel to be repaired? That is the task that we have. And so I believe that we have to be innovative, creative, and bold, just as Secretary Robert demanded that we be bold in thinking about that process. In reconstruction, um, you know, many of the, the reconstruction officers wanted to know what Black people wanted. What they said was that they wanted land, tools, and effectively to be left on their own. They wanted, in other words, to be able to devise their own future. And so I believe that this task force is required to really think very hard about what Black people want and to marshal all of our energies and labors and efforts and resources to help satisfy that demand. So again, I'm really honored to be here and to serve on this, on, on this task force um, and to serve the, the communities of the, the Black communities of the state of California. And hopefully we can go on to create a, a model for a national term of, of, of reparation, which is also due. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Javon Scott Lewis. We will move on to Mon Monica Montgomery Stepp for your introductory remarks. Monica, is your audio working? While we move on uh, to figuring out our technical difficulties, we will go instead to Camila Moore for your introductory remarks. Sure. Good morning, everyone. It is an honor. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here. My name is Camila Victoria Moore. First, I would like to take this time to thank my ancestors and then my family, friends, and colleagues for their unwavering guidance and support. I would also like to thank Governor Gavin Newsom, Attorney General Bonta, Speaker Anthony Rendon for appointing me, Secretary of State Shirley Weber, and President Pro Tem Tony Atkins. Aguila Victoria Moore, and I am an attorney with a specialization in intellectual property and entertainment transactions. I earned a Juris Doctorate from Columbia Law School in New York City 
a Master of Laws degree in International Criminal Law from the University of Amsterdam, and a Bachelor's degree from the University of California, Los Angeles, or UCLA. I am also a Repertory Justice Scholar and proudly serve as advisory board members for two grassroots organizations, the Coalition for a Just and Equitable California, or CJEC, and the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants Los Angeles Chapter. NAASD and CJEC worked closely with then Assembly Member Shirley Weber to craft the crucial and first of its kind specificity language that is reflected in AB 3121 and ultimately ensured its passage through coordinating public comment, other forms of testimony, and strategic outreach to key legislators. As a law student, I contributed to human rights reports related to domestic and international human rights issues, including but not limited to racial inequality in Brazil, the human right to sanitation in Lowndes County, Alabama, United States, and the human right to remedy for indigenous black women affected by racialized gender violence in Papua New Guinea. While studying abroad at the University of Amsterdam, I began writing a master thesis exploring the intersections between international law and repertory justice for the transatlantic slave trade, chattel slavery, and their legacies. I am looking forward to serving as a task force member, and ultimately, I look forward to beginning and contributing to substantive discussions surrounding the importance of reparations for Black Americans who are descendants of persons enslaved in the United States. Namely, I am looking forward to ensuring that any reparations pa package that the task force develops fully comports with international law, which mandates reparations come in the form of compensation, restitution, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantees of non-repetition. Thank you, it is an honor. Thank you very much, Camila Moore. We will try next now to return to Monica Montgomery Step to see if we've worked out the technical difficulty kinks on our end. Monica? Okay, so it appears that the answer is not yet. So we will again skip Monica and instead uh, move ahead to Don Tamaki. Don, your introduction. Thank you and, and condolences, Monica. I know how that feels. Um, first, I wanna to say to the members of the task force, uh, each of you so accomplished having devoted much of your lives to the pursuit of social justice. Whether as civil rights icons, as elected leaders, professors, activists, scholars, I really am honored to be among you. I also want to express my thanks to uh, Secretary Weber for authoring the bill and for her moving words. Thank you, Governor Newsom, the appointment staff, the selection committee, and the hard work of the Attorney General's office under uh, Rob Bonta especially the Civil Rights Enforcement Division, who have been laboring since, I understand, November of 2020 to ensure that the task force has a running start. As a Japanese American, I want to say that this groundbreaking study of and recommendations with respect to reparations is long, long overdue. While the oppression imposed, oppression imposed on African Americans is unparalleled in its breadth, in brutality, in duration, and continuity. And anti-Black racism, I believe, is uniquely per pernicious and unrelenting. Asian Americans still know something about discrimination. Following Roosevelt's signing of Executive Order 9066, the government surrounded Tanferan Racetrack in San Bruno, which is just south of San Francisco, with barbed wire and machine gun towers and forced at gunpoint about 7,800 Americans of Japanese ancestry and crammed them into horse stalls, my parents included. 
while 10 more permanent American style concentration camps were being constructed from California to Arkansas, which ultimately uh, confined, in which ultimately 120,000 Japanese Americans were confined. Despite being incarcerated, my father was drafted into the US Army. And after war's end, my parents bought a house in Oakland. Despite that, he was a veteran. Some white neighbor, neighbors came calling, demanded that they move. And the real estate agent who sold them the house was fired. But unlike African-American veterans, at least they were able to get a conventional bank loan. When uh, Dr. Brown was talking about um, urban renewal, redevelopment in San Francisco, the San Francisco Japantown community was a part of that decimation. It used to be 36 blocks until the city declared it a blighted area and declared it a slum, as Dr. Brown referred to. And ultimately, uh, Japanese Americans called their forced eviction from properties that they owned the second uh, forced removal. I believe Senator Bradford also made the same reference uh, to what's happened all over the country, but certainly in Southern California as well. I also want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Grills for talking about the underlying causes of America's pathology, so to speak. Um, in reopening uh, the Korematsu case, we represented Fred Korematsu in the 1980s. Uh, reopening the 1944 Supreme Court case that upheld the legality of the rounding up of Japanese Americans and one of the worst decisions the court has ever rendered, uh, right up there with Plessy versus Ferguson and Dred Scott. Um, we were surprised to discover secret intelligence reports from the Navy, the FBI, and the FCC, which stated that the Army's claims of rounding up Japanese Americans were falsehoods and lies and that Japanese Americans had done no wrong and certainly posed no threat. I think what the, Dr. Grills was referring to is that when the culture of prejudice becomes so strong uh, and overwhelming, facts don't matter, the law doesn't matter, and the Constitution doesn't matter. And so we've seen that play out in what happened to Japanese Americans. We're watching it in real time as the inquiry in Tulsa uh, proceeds. And I, I completely agree with her uh, as that underlying value system uh, and psychology really needs to look at, be looked at. Well, personally, if it wasn't for the Black Civil Rights Movement and the inspiration of Dr. Martin Luther King and Black lawyers who were role models for me when I was growing up in Oakland, I probably would not have become an attorney. And for most other Asian Americans, they or their ancestors immigrated after the passage of the Immigration Reform Act of 1965, which eliminated racist quotas that would have otherwise barred their entry. So Asian Americans, as with other uh, marginalized groups, owe so much to the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s, including their very presence here. Moreover, the 18-year campaign for Japanese American redress and reparations was inspired by the African by African Americans demanding that the nation live up to its espoused principles. Black leaders like Congressman Ron Dellum supported our cause. And while we rejoiced when the Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was passed, it also rightly prompted the question by African Americans: what about us? What about us? To that question, the Japanese American community looks forward to sharing our experience and particularly the power of acknowledgement, uh, which some of the speakers have talked about when the pain and the harm is brought out in the open and acknowledged. Many Asian American organizations stand poised to support the efforts of this task force and to expose the model minority myth that has been used to pit racial groups against each other. Furthermore, many Americans of all races know that each time that America has chosen to be more inclusive and acknowledge and repair injustice, it has become stronger to the benefit of us all. 
So I'm very much looking forward to learning from each of you, uh, the members of this task force, and working with you. Thank you. Thank you, Don Tamaki. We will now go once again uh, with our fingers crossed to Monica Montgomery Seth, who I see on our screen. Thank you, Monica. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, third time is a charm. It had to be one of us and it was me. Um, Good uh, morning. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Monica Montgomery Stepp. I am council member for District 4 in the city of San Diego, which is our historically uh, Black community in San Diego. Uh, certainly, the demographics have changed because we have experienced eminent domain. We have also experienced a freeway being built through our thriving community decades ago, and we certainly see the impact of that now. I want to uh, thank Dr. Weber, who at the time that this bill passed was my assembly member and also is certainly a mentor of mine uh, and many of us as we're growing up in San Diego. In addition to that, President Pro Tem Atkins uh, for the appointment to this task force, in addition to the governor uh, and all who were involved in getting this bill across uh, the finish line is certainly long overdue. Um, I uh, maintain an advocacy role in San Diego uh, in many different ways at the ACLU, uh, leading the local campaign on bail reform uh, as a staffer uh, for the former council member. I did walk out of the office in protest when she indicated after we received a study on racial profiling that determined what the community members had been telling us about racial, being racially profiled by officers. And she stated that uh, black people deserve to be arrested because black people commit all the crimes. I left that office in protest. Uh, I ended up running against her. Uh, I went against uh, the entire establishment who, do, who does uh, tend to hold uh, those white supremacist values up, uh, went against the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, labor and business in San Diego. It was a complete community effort as was uh, this bill. And I am uh, very grateful to be holding the spot for such a time as this. Um, you know, in San Diego, working on a lot of issues that impact African-American people, uh, and particularly uh, criminal justice issues, it does always feel like something is missing. And that is because as many policies as we pass, there are also um, matters of the heart. And there is also, as uh, Dr. Grills was speaking of earlier, there is the why. And so I will continue to do the work of passing policies, understanding though, that we have so much work to do when it comes to repairing um, the state of African-American people in uh, this state. Uh, hopefully we will be an example nationwide. I think that is one of the goals. And I'm very, very honored to, to be here serving on this historic task force. I also view this personally. Uh, I watched my father every day as an entrepreneur get up uh, and work toward his dream of building generational wealth for his family and being held back by the system that I'm now a part of and that I can now sit here and uh, make it different for my brother and my nephew and all of those that are coming behind us and will benefit from the work that we are doing here today. So. Uh, thank you, everyone. I'm honored to be here, and uh, I'm looking forward to this work. Thank you, Council Member. We very much appreciate your patience with us this morning. We will move right along uh, to our next agenda item, which will begin with a brief presentation of the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. On your screen, you will see some slides. We've also made these available on our website and we will endeavor to move as quickly through them we can, as we can this morning to get us back on schedule. Jesleen, slide. So we'll be first doing um, an overview in the purpose and application of the Bagley Keene Act to state bodies. We will talk about what is a meeting and what is not a meeting. 
And then we will talk about scheduling and conducting a public meeting, close sessions, and end with some key takeaways um, to keep in mind as we move forward. Slide. Policy behind the Bagley Keen Act is to make sure that the actions of state bodies happen openly and that the public is ensured a seat at the table. The goals are transparency and the opportunity for participation. The act does this by requiring that meetings be open to the public and that the public be given advance notice of meetings and a chance to comment at meetings. The Bagley Keen Act applies to state bodies, including every state board commission or similar multi-member body created by the statute or California constitution. This task force was created by government code section 8301.1 when AB 3121 was adopted in 2020, and that is a state body subject to the act. Slide. The next couple of slides address what makes a meeting for the purposes of the act. A meeting occurs when a majority of the members of a body gather or communicate to discuss, hear, or deliberate on the state body's business. Jesslyn, can you go back a slide, please? So two things are important to remember. One, there has to be a majority of members, which in the task force's case is anything more than five because there are a total of nine appointed members. And if a body has vacancies, and we certainly hope that this task force never does, the vacancies do not count in figuring out what is the majority. Two, and we will talk about this more later, the act was specifically amended a few years ago a few years ago to define a meeting to not only be a physical gathering, but also a collective communication, including by email or phone. This is also known as a serial meeting, and it is one of the most important concepts that this task force needs to understand, namely that we can risk inadvertently violating Bagley Keen when we communicate by email or forward communications to multiple members of the task force. Slide. So again, a meeting is a gathering or communication between a majority of members to hear, discuss, or deliberate on task force issues, and it includes all phases of decision making. Slide. Here are some examples of the types of decision making and actions that are subject to the act because they involve task force business. If any of these involve a majority of task force members, whether collectively at once or serially, they are not permitted outside of a public hearing and may only be discussed at a noticed public meeting. Those include clarifying the task force's jurisdiction, conversations to facilitate agreement or compromise, conversations that advance the resolution of any issue and any aspect of the deliberative process. Slide. And again, we remind you that the prohibition in the act on serial communications applies to all forms of communication. And uh, we've included a number of graphics on this slide to really stress that point. Um, these typically arise in connection with emails, telephone calls, or text messages between members. Um, and a series of individual communications between one person and another task force member can result in a serial meeting. Slide. Here are some examples of serial communications. A chain of communications, either directly or through personal intermediaries or tech devices by a majority of members to discuss, deliberate, or take any action on any item of business. Even if communications do not take place at the same time and place, and each communication involves less than a majority of members, if the series of communications, when taken as a whole, involves a majority, it may violate the act. Slide. Here are some things to keep in mind when communicating with fellow task force members. First, do not talk with other members about informational memos or agenda items outside of a properly noticed public meeting. Members may engage in purely social conversations with other members. A majority of the members may attend conferences or similar events that are open to the public and of general interest, purely social or ceremonial events, local public meetings, 
and open and public meetings of another state body as long as members do not discuss task force matters among themselves. Slide. Here are some things to keep in mind when communicating with the public. Members may communicate individually with members of the public to share the work of the task force, indicate whether the views expressed are those of the task force or their own, and listen to comments from the public. Members must not indicate to the public how they intend to vote on a matter pending before the task force. Slide. There is a staff briefing exception that will apply to your team here at the DOJ. The staff may brief or respond to questions from individual task force members. Our team may not share communications from a task force member with any other task force member. And a good rule of thumb here is please do not reply all. Bye. Now we're going to talk about what is not a meeting. Slide. A meeting is not a communication between the task force member and any other person as long as it is not used to circumvent the serial meeting requirement. Slide. Some other examples include conferences that are open to the public, open meetings of other public bodies, or open subcommittee meetings of another state body, and social events. Slide. We'll now talk about scheduling and conducting a public meeting. Slide. In general, each public meeting needs to be subject to notice and an agenda. Both must be posted at least 10 calendar days before the meeting, and both will be posted to the task force's website, as was done in preparation for this meeting. A state body may hold meetings with less than 10 days calendar notice in two situations. First, special meetings, and second, emergency meetings. We do not anticipate that either of these situations will occur during the life of the task force, but we will respond appropriately if they do. The notice must be provided in writing to anyone who requests a copy, and the agenda must include a brief description of each specific matter. Anyone may request to receive notices for all meetings of the task force, and this is done via our website. Slide. Public has certain rights under the Bagley Keen Open Meeting Act. First, they have the right to participate at public meetings without identification and subject to reasonable time limits like those that we will have today. Second, they have the right to access public meeting records, although some records may be exempt from disclosure. And third, they have the right to monitor votes of each task force member, which is why we'll be voting by roll call in general today and moving forward in our meetings. Importantly here, the task force is not required to respond to comments from the public, only to listen to them. The task force may send information to the members without sharing it with the public. However, some documents may be subject to being made public upon request, and records exempt from disclosure under the Public Records Act remain exempt from disclosure even if they are considered or discussed at a meeting. Slide. With COVID um, and Executive Order N-29-20, certain rules relating to the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act have been eased during the pandemic, and meetings can be held entirely remotely, as we are doing today. Under those circumstances, there is no physical location to make documents previously distributed to the task force members available to the public. Accordingly, and although not specifically required, the task force will consider posting on its website any materials members receive before a meeting, which we have done with the materials uh, that are being presented today. When the executive order is lifted, we will return to in-person meetings. Slide. We will now be discussing what can happen in a closed session. Slide. Certain matters may be discussed in a closed session. Those include personnel matters, matters affecting individual privacy, administrative disciplinary matters, pending litigation, responding to a confidential final draft of an audit record, 
and the threat of criminal or terrorist activity. Importantly here, a state body like the task force cannot schedule a closed session independently of a noticed open meeting of the body. And if a closed session does occur, the state body is required to designate a staff person to attend the closed session and to record in a book a record of topics discussed and decisions made. That record in the book is available only to task force members or if there is a legal challenge to a court of general jurisdiction. Information received or discussed during a closed session cannot be disclosed to outside parties. Um, and even though closed session itself and what is discussed is confidential, the state body must generally disclose in an open me meeting the general nature of the items to be discussed. Slide. As we come to a close, we're going to share some final summary and takeaways uh, that we ask the task force to keep in mind moving forward. Slide. First, when the task force meets to gather information, deliberate, or make a decision, the bagley keene Act requires that the public have a seat at the table in most instances. Second, serial meetings conducted outside of a noticed public meeting that ultimately involve a majority of the task force members frustrate the Act's goals of transparency and may violate the law. Third, the Act's requirement for a 10-day notice and agenda, public testimony, and the conduct of open meetings ensure the public's right of participation in the task force's consensus building process. Slide. A member may individually contact DOJ staff to ask questions or gather information about an upcoming item, so long as the member and staff do not share these conversations with other members outside of a properly noticed meeting. When a member receives information from staff, please do not communicate with other members about that information. If information is sent by email to all members, please do not reply all. And again, a member may communicate individually with members of the public to share the work of the task force, indicate whether the views expressed are those of the task force of their own, and listen to comments from the public. Slide. Please do not discuss task force business with more than one other member outside of a public meeting to avoid creating an inadvertent advisory body. And again, the majority of the task force may be present at social events, meetings of other public bodies, and public conferences, but may not discuss task force business outside of a properly noticed task force meeting. We'll now pause here for any questions related to Bagley Keene. Okay. Hi. Hello. Yes, Member Sawyer. Yeah, there's a lot of things that we can't do. Um, is what can we do? Uh, it, it, I come from a body where you have, you can have an individual uh, group, um, anybody come to you and express their opinion on a bill, on a budget issue, and things of that nature. The, the way I'm reading what you, you're saying is your interpretation of Bagley Keen is they can't do it or they need to go through you or we need to have you present. I'm not, I don't want to break any of staff laws, but uh, thank you for that it. question. How how do we how do we make sure we're as transparent as possible? I guess is what I'm saying. Thank you for that question, Member Joan Sawyer. Again, you can interact with members of the public. When you do so, you need to be clear on whether you are expressing the views of the task force or yourself individually um, in, when you are interacting. And you cannot indicate how you will vote on a matter or an item that is coming before the task force. But you can certainly communicate with members of the public. OK, again, if someone comes to my office and I'm for a bill, I can communicate that. So are you saying that the legislature is out of compliance? I'm saying that in the guidance that our office regularly provides to state bodies all across California, we share 
that board members, commission members, task force members should not indicate to members of the public outside of a public meeting how they are going to vote on an item of official business. Okay. Maybe I need to talk to our lawyers and, and, and see what their opinion is. So that sounds... here I would just notice, um, Member Joan Sawyer, that the rules that are applicable to the state legislature are different than the rules that are in the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act applicable to state bodies. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Thank you for your question. Uh, I will pause here for any additional questions from the task force members. Okay, hearing none, we will move on to our next agenda item, which is an overview of AB 3121. Thank you. Can I intercede real quick before we do that? I'm just trying to get a run of show right now. How long is this going to take? Because I have to be on the floor in, in five minutes. And I thought there was a vote action that we needed to take. Thank you again for your patience. I believe that was Senator Bradford. Uh, That's correct. Senator, we've been in communication with your staff. Uh, the task force member introductions took a little bit longer than we had budgeted. Um, and so Senator, that's my call right now. Understood. So we will continue to be in communication with your staffer uh, to reach you when we need you for a vote. The upcoming vote will be on the next agenda item, the leadership selection for the task force. Rue? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kamalu Gorsing, and I'm a Deputy Attorney General in the Civil Rights Enforcement Section of the California Department of Justice, where I am assisting with legal and, and administrative support for this task force. I will be presenting a summary of the requirements of AB 3121, the law that governs this task force. As a courtesy warning, I would like to inform you that there will be photos shown throughout my presentation which are related to incidents of racial violence. You can access the photos and PowerPoint shown here on our AB3121 website. I will summarize the law's legislative findings, its purpose, the duties, membership, and powers of the task force, the consideration of a state level reparation scheme and the task force's administration and termination. The photo shown here depicts the Ku Klux Klan engaging in cross burning, an act of racial terror. What is so important about this photo is that it was taken in 1980 in a suburb outside of Sacramento. It highlights California's recent racist past, past that is not often recognized or discussed in formal narratives of California history. I would like to acknowledge the valuable contributions of countless civil rights activists, advocates, legislators, and community stakeholders who have advocated for reparations for the Black community for decades. It is due to the work of these individuals that the task force has access to a treasure trove of resources and is well situated to be able to do the important work ahead. AB 3121 was introduced February 21st, 2020 by then Assembly Member and now Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, who you heard from earlier today. It was signed into law by Governor Gavin Newsom, who you also heard from earlier today on September 30th, 2020. AB 3121 makes a number of legislative findings, which can be found at the beginning of the bill. AB 3121 states that the U.S. government protected and supported slavery through its laws and the Constitution. The bill further states that slavery was an immoral and inhumane deprivation of life. 
Pictured here is Mifflin Gibbs, a civil rights activist from San Francisco who became the first black elected municipal judge in the country. He helped fund the legal case of an enslaved person named Archie Lee. Mr. Lee was brought to California by his slave owner, but escaped. Initially, he was declared free, but later he was returned to slavery by the California Supreme Court. Mr. Gibbs, pictured here, helped raise money for Mr. Lee's case, which eventually resulted in his freedom. The legislative findings of the bill state that so much evidence exists today which documents the system of discrimination created during slavery and maintained for centuries after. U.S. institutions have continued to benefit from the destruction of Black life. This photo is a clear example of this. After slavery was formally abolished, ten, tens of thousands of Black people were arrested on false or petty charges. They were forced to work without pay as convicts, a form of re-enslavement. The Imperial Sugar Company is one corporation that benefited from this re-enslavement. It operated in California in the late 1990s and continues to operate successfully nationally today. The effects of systemic racism continue to be felt, as Attorney General Bonta stated, today and every day. This has resulted in enormous wealth disparities between Black and white Americans. As you can see from this graph, these disparities exist even when Black and white Americans are at the same education level. Now I will discuss the purpose of the task force. Per AB 3121, this task force will study and develop proposals to address slavery, to address discrimination that is explicitly supported by law, de jure discrimination, and to address discrimination that is not explicitly supported by law but still exists, which is de facto discrimination. The task force must also address the lingering effects of slavery on Black people in California. One of these effects is segregation in education. In 2019, a court ordered the Sausalito Marin City School District to desegregate based on an investigation conducted by the Civil Rights Enforcement Section of the Attorney General's Office. Among the many duties of the task force, the first is to accurately summarize and describe the institution of slavery. In the state of California, there were prominent and powerful pro-slavery forces in the state legislature and judiciary. In 1852, slaveholders from South Carolina and Florida petitioned the state assembly to establish a permanent slave colony in California. Biddy Mason, pictured here, was brought to California by a slave owner. She continued to experience enslave, enslavement in California for five years, even though it was supposedly a free state. Mason eventually sued her owner and won her own freedom in court in 1856. The task force is required to identify and describe federal and state laws that discriminate against Black people and descendants of enslaved people today. This photograph depicts a protest in the aftermath of the death of Stephon Clark, an unarmed Black man killed by police in his grandmother's backyard. According to the Racial Identity Profiling Advisory Board report from 2020, in California, individuals perceived to be Black were searched by the police at nearly three times the rate of individuals perceived to be white. The task force must recommend remedies which address international standards of reparations and recommend a formal apology on behalf of the people of California. The task force must also develop, a, pr develop proposals to eliminate California laws and policies that continue to discriminate against Black communities. The task force must recommend remedies to reverse the injuries sustained by Black communities. The task force must determine how compensation for injuries should be calculated, distributed, and who is eligible to receive it. The task force must also recommend how the California public can be educated of the findings it makes. A report must be submitted to the state legislature by June 1st, 2022. The membership of the task force. We heard the members of the task force introduce themselves earlier, so I will now summarize the legal requirements for their appointment. There are nine members appointed to the task force who come from diverse backgrounds. We heard them speak earlier today.
they will serve for the life of the task force until it sunsets. The task force will be able to hold hearings with only five people, as that constitutes a quorum. Later in today's meeting, the task force will elect a chair and a vice chair. The state legislature has set a limit of 10 public hearings for the task force. The task force has the power to hold public hearings at any time and anywhere in California. This power is currently subject to the executive order to hold public meetings, public hearings due to COVID-19. When that executive order lifts, the task force will resume in-person meetings, which the DOJ staff will plan with the chair and vice chair, as you'll hear later. The task force has a power to request testimony, document production, and issue subpoenas. The task force may also request information from state agencies. The task force will receive the administrative, technical, and legal assistance of the DOJ, which is why I am doing this presentation. The task force may also compensate personnel and enter into contracts. AB 3121 specifically states that any reparations provided by the state of California will not replace federal reparations. Finally, the task force automatically sunsets on July 1st, 2023, which is the statutory deadline. It is a great privilege and honor to assist this historic task force in working to advocate for reparations that are long overdue. Thank you very much for listening to this presentation. We will now move on to leadership selection. Um, I will ask my colleague to share the appropriate presentation for that agenda item. Slide. Government Code Section 8301.2, subsection H, subsection H, excuse me, provides that the task force shall elect a chair and a vice chair from among its members, and the term of office shall be for the life of the task force. Slide. The government code sections do not delineate the precise duties of the chair and the vice chair based on the experience of our office in staffing and supporting various boards and commissions. We anticipate the following duties for these roles. First, we anticipate the chair will collaborate with the DOJ team here to develop agenda and meeting materials for the future nine hearings of the task force. That in future meetings, the chair will guide the task force through the agenda items and try to keep us on schedule. And finally, that the chair will lead the meeting through public comment and every meeting will have a public comment section. Slide. We similarly expect that the vice chair will collaborate uh, with the development of the meeting agenda and materials, and that the vice chair will fill in for the chairperson in event of unavailability for a public meeting. Slide. We have unmuted and enabled video for each of the task force members who will be seen on screen. And we now invite the task force members to discuss among themselves uh, chair and vice selection. Uh, the discussion will culminate in uh, hopefully a motion and a second for chair and vice, uh, resulting in a vote, which again we will do by roll call. Should we start by gaining some interest um, by maybe even a show of hands or just um, by voice? If anyone is interested in running for, let's say, first chair of the task force? Uh, where am I? Oh. You're unmuted. Everyone is unmuted. So I 